Hello again everyone, it's me Matt, thank you so much for joining me today on this video. We are going to Japan today, talking about tracked armoured fighting vehicles and the main battle tank Type 74. Before we get into the video, I would like to personally thank everyone so much for financially supporting and contributing towards my channel, whether it be you sending me fan mail in the PO box, which I'll be opening in the next few videos or so, or just contributing to supporting my channel. It really does mean a lot. I know those who have been supporting on Patreon and PayPal, it really does come from the bottom of my heart when I say I appreciate each and every one of you. So thank you for helping me along on my YouTube journey. As I said before, we are talking about main battle tanks today, and you would think that uh, a nation such as Japan, with an island nation, would not produce main battle tanks of the highest quality or standard. You'd be completely wrong. I have done many videos already on Japanese main battle tanks, and they are formidable military technology that are capable of doing so much and actually one of my favorite uh, tank groups out there globally uh, that I have a favorite sort of attachment to because they are just incredible bits of technology. Now, the Type 74, although a little older in its design and its purpose, still is quite capable of today compared to some of the more old school tanks that are still in service around other nations around the world. Now, obviously, after the Second World War, Japan was left devastated and for all intents and purposes under American control, with a sizable garrison of US troops stationed all around the country. It only gradually regained its political sovereignty starting in the early 1950s, a process that included the reformation of the formal Japanese army with tanks and everything else. Now, Japan started its post-war military armored corps history with several hundred Chaffee light tanks and around 250 Sherman tanks of the EZ-8 variant or the M4A3E8. Naturally, these came from American wartime surplus, which was a logical choice given the circumstances. However, these vehicles did have some notable issues. As I've stated in many other videos that I've done, Japan is a country with a lot of difficult terrain for tanks, especially in obvious places like mountains. This is a fact that dictates the Japanese defensive strategies and of course armored fighting vehicle design to this day. Now, for obvious reasons, this has proven to be quite a problem for the vehicles I just mentioned. The Shermans in particular had difficulties traversing through rough terrain of the Hokkaido Island where Soviet invasion, based on American doctrine practiced by the Japanese as well as other intelligence, was most likely to take place. The Shafi tanks didn't suffer from this problem and were generally well liked by the Japanese, but they had other issues. Specifically, the Korean War experience has shown that the gun of the Shafi had issues when dealing with the Soviet-designed T-34 Dash 85 medium tank. The Japanese, therefore, tried their best to look for something in the need of a lightweight tank category, but needed to be heavily armored enough to be able to actually take on Soviet medium or heavy tanks. Another consideration was similar to the rationale behind the Leopard 1 or the AMX 30 design. The 1950s were the era of rapidly emerging technologies, including anti tank guided missiles. It was believed that the missiles would make an armor obsolete anyway, so why not shed it almost completely in favor of high mobility? And so the rather unique Japanese doctrine was born, combining light armor, solid firepower, and most importantly, the ability to traverse some of the roughest terrain on an island you could ever imagine. The first post-war Japanese tank built around the era was the Type 61 main battle tank, combining low weight with the 90mm gun that was thought to be capable of defeating Soviet tanks in the 1950s. It was not a bad machine for the 1950s, that is. However, it entered service in 1961 and remained in production until 1975. By that time, though, it was completely obsolete in the contending world stage for tanks. Or rather, it was obsolete even though as it entered service still. After all, in the 1960s, the Soviets had already had the T-55 and 62 tanks designed as medium tanks, while the British were also deploying the Centurion. The Japanese were well aware of the inadequacy of the Type 61 MBT, and lively discussions were held regarding the future of the Japanese tank design. The first idea was to upgrade the Type 61 with a 105mm rifle gun, but in 1965 it was scrapped in favour of developing an entirely new vehicle, and good for them for trying so. Through the 1960s, even before the 1965 decision, the development of specific components for the upcoming MBT took place. It needed hydraulic suspension since 1961, stronger 700 horsepower engine ready by March 1965, and the 105mm rifle cannon needed to be ready and tested between 1966 and 1967. The hydraulic suspension was a solution to the rough terrain issue, but was mechanically quite complex and took some time to develop. It was tested quite early using the Type 60 APC, but it would take years before it was ready to actually be placed on the next main battle tank. The gun, on the other hand, was based on the Royal Ordnance L7 series and shared the barrel with it. 
but the breech, recoil management system and other elements of the gun were indigenous. It was therefore not an L7 copy, as many sources claim. In fact, it resembled the American M68 105mm rifle gun. By 1966, the gun was inserted into a newly developed narrow turret and firing tests were carried out. During the years that followed, the Japanese built the first 35-ton test bed designed as the STT. That served them well during the suspension and engine trials. After that, two prototypes, the STB-1 and the STB-2, were designed and built with large success. The early STB prototype characteristics were as follows. The tank weighed 38 tons, had a crew of four, and was made entirely of steel due to the philosophy of armor obsolescence, which, as we know today, is certainly not the key. That does not mean that steel was thin though, the armor was quite powerful in certain areas. The turret front was 120mm, sides 110 rear 60 turret top 40 and the hull side and hull rear were roughly 35 to 25 millimeters in steel thickness, which overall was not too bad. The tank was powered by a quite powerful Mitsubishi 10ZF 21WT 750 horsepower engine paired with a Mitsubishi MT 57T transmission, allowing for a rather impressive maximum speed of 53 kilometers an hour. The suspension was impressive also, and was hydraulic and variable with clearance. It could either go to 400mm plus or minus 200mm. The tracks were 550mm wide and the ground pressure was also very low. The adjustability of the suspension allowed the vehicle to get into hull down positions, somewhat shoot around hillsides, or most importantly really just dig itself in for any kind of potential attack from other tanks in the hilly environments that it would be fighting in. The STB prototypes were armed with the Japanese version of the Royal Ordnance L7 rifled gun and it was loaded manually and would fire the following shells. The L28A1 APDS or Armoured Piercing Discarding Sabo imported from the UK with 240mm of penetration at 1km, the Type 91 High Explosive Anti-Tank and the Type 75 High Explosive Penetrator T, licensed produced as the M393 HEP. The vehicle had an impressive 50 rounds of ammunition inside, 28 in the front, 7 below the turret floor, 9 in the rear and 6 in a special loading assist device. This device was basically a mechanical assistant with a 4 round capacity, basically an improved ready rack that allowed the gunner and loader to fire 1 round each 4 seconds exposure. After that the rate of fire dropped. The gun could elevate to plus 9 degrees and depress to minus 6 degrees, but these values were further enhanced by the suspension since the vehicle could both tilt to the front and to the back and to the sides. With this tilting, the gun elevation and depression reached plus 15 and minus 12 degrees, almost turning it into an artillery piece. Additionally, the gun was very accurate thanks to, at the time, cutting edge technologies such as ballistic computers and laser rangefinders. This is integral to the fire control system of the tank itself. Overall, the Japanese were very satisfied with the design, and the next four STB prototype iterations from 1970 to 1971 were more about making the tank affordable than any further major improvements overall. The engine was a source of reliability issues, and for the production version it would be detuned to a 720 horsepower. This variant was called the 10ZF 22WT with a 21.5 litre air-cooled V10 turbocharged two-stroke diesel. The loading assist device was also dropped as it was very expensive. The vehicle had a remote controlled turret machine gun that was also dropped, the design of the turret changed somewhat but not too much, and the transmission was simplified and only featured one reverse gear. One of the STB prototypes was shown to the public in 1972 and immediately caught public attention thanks to its rather beautiful sleek lines. The turret itself, I must admit, is rather somewhat aerodynamic. Now, in 1973, the STB design was reviewed based on the final STB-6 prototype and approved for mass production under the designation of the Type 74. Success was expected of this tank so much that the Japanese Minister of Defense at the time tried to have it named after him, despite not being connected to it in any way, shape or form. That notion completely failed. The tank was produced by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries between 1975 and 1988, and 893 vehicles were built. It almost makes you wonder how you fit 893 of these tanks on the island of Japan, but hey, just kidding. With some smaller exceptions, like the engine detuning, the prototype data listed was actually applied to the production vehicle as well, especially regarding its armor. The problem was that at the time of it entering service, the tank was once again fairly obsolete. Now this may sound quite strange considering the fact that Japan is generally regarded as a technological superpower, 
But with so much effort focused on post-war rebuilding and what is generally known as Japanese economic miracles, Japan wasn't really in a position to invest extreme sums of money into tank development to make them more future-proof. Another aspect was the fact that Japan did not export its military items at all and had little in terms of co-development with other Western nations. Some technologies were purchased, but much of the research was completely indigenous and therefore took excessive amounts of time and money. As a result, Japanese armoured vehicles were produced in low numbers and were quite incredibly expensive. In order to split the development costs into the production run, they actually actually do double designs on some things to see if they could keep it even cheaper, and this is a common thing for Japanese armoured fighting vehicles, or technology in general. This in turn made them a popular target for public criticism and budget cuts that would follow in a vicious circle, which is unfair to the designers of these tanks, especially like the Type 74, which in theory for its time, if it was kept within the time constraints of when it was designed to actually fight other tanks, would have been a very, very good tank. The Japanese were, of course, aware of that fact though, and once again they were in possession of an obsolete MBT that was inferior to the Soviet T-72 series, which is why a development program for its replacement was called the TKX, and was launched in the early 1970s, and that program resulted in the Type 90 MBT which I have done a video on. This was only available starting from 1990 though. The Soviet Union fell apart one year later, and as you already know the rest of the story. It's worth noting that several patterns of this tank were produced over the years. Type 74 initial production models were about 400 of them. There was the Type 74 Mod B, which was an improved fire control system with the ability to fire armoured piercing thin stabilised discarding sabre rounds. And the Type 74 Model C, which was basically a Model B, with actual camouflage instead of the standard khaki colour. And the D, features a thermal sleeve for the gun, and everything was older and generally upgraded to Mod D. And then finally the mod E, F and G, which basically had a multitude of different additions such as uh, mine clearing devices, improved night fighting equipment, spaced armor, smoke grenade launchers, things like that. Of the Type 74 Mod G, only four vehicles were built as prototypes before it was decided that the program was just not any more economically feasible. The Type 74 MBT did however still soldier on and was produced until the end of the Cold War and still to this day remains in Japanese service, at least partially. It's being decommissioned piece by piece and replaced by other vehicles such as the Type 10 MBT and the Type 16 MCV. It's never fired an actual shot in anger though, and never fought in such enemies that it was supposed to, especially the world famous Godzilla, which I always wish I could have seen these kind of tanks going against a giant lizard that came out of the ocean, but hey, that's that's the movies. Um, so here it is guys, in War Thunder as well. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, hopefully War Thunder will see this video and see if I can promote their game because I love the game and love playing it. I haven't played it for a while, but hey, it'll be time to get into the tanks again sooner or later and we'll get some live stream going and uh, play some War Thunder because it is very addictive. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining me today on this video. I hope you learned something about this incredible little main battle tank of Japanese design. Uh, I really like the fact that it is designed in-house and although it's sort of like a you know iPhone technology you buy a new iPhone it's already out of date similar kind of thing with the uh, with the tank of the type 74 but for me I just love the fact that they took it upon themselves to get everything done most of it anyway internally and it's still a very powerful and incredible tank for its time. I just wish it was able to not be given that skepticism by other nations just for the fact that Japan was still trying to rebuild its entire nation and didn't quite have the money to procure and design super tanks. But that's a story for another day and maybe we'll talk about some uh, you know, more Japanese tanks and vehicles of the future uh, that will be coming out in the uh, years to come and I'd love to learn more about them when they do because Japan's definitely on the forefront of technology and designing a new tank of today like the Type 10 and the, you know, <laughs> that's an impressive tank, one of my favorites for sure. Anyway, if you did enjoy today's video, please leave me a like, and if you want to be notified of any upcoming content, click the little bell by the subscribe button. And thank you again to everyone who has been supporting me on Patreon and PayPal. Truly, it does mean the world to me. And if you do want to follow those links or follow me uh, on any kind of financial support, you can go check out the links in the description box below. Thanks again for stopping by and have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye-bye.